So all of our speakers today are doing cutting, cutting edge work to better identify, understand, and combat human trafficking. And I hope this session today will bring attention to and catalyze new kinds of discussions on this issue and problem of human trafficking. So with that, um, I'd like to now turn it over to our first panel. Our, our first talk is entitled Discovery, Modeling, and Interdiction of Human Trafficking Networks. Um, and the co-authors of that um, work are Dominique Rosepowitz and Arun Vassen, professors at Arizona State University, Jorge Safar at the University of Florida, Tony Grubesic at the University of California uh, Riverside. So thank you so much, and I turn the floor over to you. It's so great to be here. Um, I'm going to take the lead of our presentation. We have a really great um, team that you'll see. We're very lucky. Um, we have received a National Science Foundation grant to foster our relationship and connection. Um, my name is Dominique Rosepowitz. I'm an associate professor uh, in the School of Social Work here at ASU. Um, I have a small research office on human trafficking. We study labor trafficking and do uh, facilities facilitate and uh, sort of sponsor labor trafficking outreach in our community in the Phoenix area, greater, greater Maricopa area um, for day laborers. We also um, work with, I am the clinical director of a housing program, a HUD funded housing program for sex trafficked women and their children. And I also facilitate research with two different police departments and uh, encourage innovation working in human trafficking, trying to get people to do things that maybe uh, they've never thought of before to try to combat this problem, particularly with adults. Um, <clears throat> but we do extensive training. I've developed curriculum for uh, jails and prisons, residential programs and detention programs for working with victims from a clinical perspective. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our grant and what we do um, and how we've uh, started to build our research. I wanted to give you a little bit of a, um, a quick background on right there it goes. <clears throat> Just a definition of using the trafficking in person uh, victim, oh, the trafficking, TVPA, trafficking victims, uh, person to act, um, to, to really have an understanding in the domestic field, what we use as our guidelines. So for example, at my housing program, um, we have a limit of who can who can come in. They have to meet this federal criteria. So to, to use the most simple uh, terms, sex trafficking is the forcing or inducing of uh, to engage in commercial sex um, or a person under the age of 18 engages in sex for something of value. That's a place to stay, protection, food, uh, drugs, um, anything that they need. Labor trafficking is being forced or induced to perform work involving restriction of freedom, rec involves recruitment, grooming, and work for the gain of the trafficker. Uh, sex trafficking is much, much easier to prove. We have hundreds of cases here in Arizona each year. We have had two labor trafficking cases in Arizona since 2011. So we have some big uh, discrepancies on how we use these laws. The TVPA was created to uh, that really gave us the language of domestic and foreign born victims of sex trafficking. Um, remember in domestic violence, I always try to say this, that that really began in 2000, in the, in the 1970s. We started understanding domestic violence and interpersonal violence, and not until the year 2000 did we actually have federal language to guide our research and to guide our work around trafficking. We understood there was prostitution and, and, and pimps, but we really didn't have the federal language language that, that dispersed into the states. In 2019, the U.S. was one of the top three countries with the largest number of human trafficking victims identified, including um, the other two were Mexico and the Philippines. <laughs> Excuse me. And in 2018, the unit, the U.S. Uh, human trafficking hotline run by Polaris had 10,900 human trafficking cases. Um, more than 75% of those cases were related to sex trafficking. So again, we have uh, an overrepresentation of sex trafficking. When we do other types of research, like surveying homeless young adults, we certainly see much more equivalency of those problems. We're just not doing such a great job. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Um, so uh, we are going to talk, uh oh, I feel like we're missing a slide. Hold on. Nope. Okay. So our research question that we are addressing when we go into uh, this work in multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary work is to take the voices of victims and 
detectives and people working in the fields of both drug trafficking and, and uh, human trafficking and try to see if those networks are connected. So we're using uh, interviews and conversations with detectives. Um, sometimes our language doesn't match and, and trying to make sure that we can understand how to pull math out and networking and mapping from the words of survivors and uh, law enforcement. And it's been a really exciting challenge. So our two research questions are, does human trafficking and drug trafficking overlap in important ways? Are the same police running into the same people? Are the same places and spaces being used? And that can really help in our interdiction work and how we uh, use science to help policing if there is an overlap. And we are seeing in some of our um, our analysis that they are very overlapped and in other situations they seem to be completely disconnected. <clears throat> and is it possible to design intervention ba interventions based on patterns found in the data? So trying to find unique pieces of data, uh, human trafficking data is really complicated to obtain. We have some public facing data like arrest reports, the FBI releases them, but I have access to inside data from law enforcement uh, criminal cases, uh, just police reports that never actually make it to the court and the opportunity to interview uh, people working in the field each day, which is really exciting. Uh, Jorge is going to talk a little bit more about this map, but this was uh, this is really how we understand taking data and putting it through and really asking good questions to it. And so one of the things that we are, here are some of our activities. We've interviewed victims of sex trafficking, both in Phoenix and in Hawaii. Um, our study uh, areas are Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Hawaii. We've conducted interviews with human trafficking detectives in Las Vegas. And we've conducted recently, I was in a women's jail in Maui, uh, conducting focus groups with victims of sex trafficking. Um, and we're looking at primary law enforcement data. We're collecting case, uh, case information, interviews, uh, evidence information, um, any type of seizure, uh, rep comments or reports by victims and perpetrators, really, really interesting things. And some of our information, like this beautiful map here, is about how um, how a trafficker moves a victim across state lines for the purpose of prostitution. So the core of sex trafficking is this act of prostitution in exchange for something else. So we were able to take out of our 1700 cases from Las Vegas since 2011, we were able to really show this movement. And what is really important is that uh, what we don't have nationally is a database that tracks the movement of either victims or traffickers. And there's huge consequences of track, track, tracking those things. And there's really good reasons we don't have that. But if we did have that, as you can see, maybe the police department in San Francisco or Northern uh, in Washington might have information on a case that was built somewhere else. And currently those ca that case data isn't being shared. And so lots of the ways that we use this data can, can influence and impact uh, interventions and what people do next. So the point of this map, which is really special and really helpful in our field to educate people about movement, especially law enforcement, to say it is a local problem but it's also a national problem is that this was for the the movement was for the purpose of prostitution and to really hold that um, connected i'm going to pass this off to eddie heldrup who will tell you about their amazing spatial data science thank you dominique yeah i appreciate that um so i won't get too into the weeds here but we'll talk about one of our i will be talking about one of our uh, initial exploratory analyses uh in trying to do some spatial crime forecasting for human trafficking. Um, so to begin with, in case you're not familiar, spatial crime forecasting is a really common approach in criminology, and it involves uh, trying to identify the locations in typically a city, but not always, where specific crimes or types of crimes occur uh, with elevated frequency, and to use that information to predict where those crimes are likely to occur in the future. And this has a lot of uh, potential benefits in terms of the application of uh, law enforcement resources or uh, public investment in an attempt to dissuade crime and, and uh, things like that. So our initial instinct when it came to the study was to see if maybe we could do something uh, like this for human trafficking. Uh, unfortunately, despite the prevalence of trafficking cases, uh, trafficking arrests themselves, specifically arrests for human trafficking, are quite rare. Um, 
In, as an example, in the city of Chicago, in the last 20 years, there have been about 150 arrests for human trafficking uh, compared to uh, tens of thousands for more common crimes such as prostitution or solicitation. And because Dominique was saying uh, the pr prostitution, uh, forcing a trafficking, a trafficked victim to engage in commercial sex work is uh, a very, very common feature of human trafficking we decided to use prostitution arrests as a proxy for trafficking uh, to attempt to see where maybe these things were occurring with the, the end goal of identifying the locations where maybe law enforcement interdiction for uh, traffickers themselves could, could occur. And so in Chicago, uh, we used the prostitution arrests and uh, a variety of potentially criminogenic factors, things like socioeconomic status of a neighborhood, uh, public investment, the location of parks and hospitals and police stations. There are dozens of variables that we use to inform a model like this. I won't go through all of them, but uh, sort of the, the typical suite of factors in a, in a city that create crime or that may correlate to crime rather, to see if we could identify locations where prostitution arrests were particularly high. So we break the city of Chicago into a series of hexagonal grid cells, as you can see. Uh, each one inherits the uh, characteristics of the urban landscape that they sort of cover, as well as data on prostitution arrests. And then this feeds into a couple of different models that we built to try to predict locations where uh, prostitution arrests were particularly high. Um, so next slide, Dom. So um, again, without getting into too much detail here, because there's really a high level overview, our models perform really well. Uh, you can see they tend to be pretty good at identifying locations where uh, there is an elevated frequency of prostitution arrests. Um, and of particular interest is looking at the areas of over and under predictions. So uh, I wanna particularly draw attention to under predictions. Uh, these are areas where our model uh, thinks, so to speak, that an area should be home to higher levels of prostitution arrests, but in fact, uh, that area is not home to those. Um, and this is particularly interesting because it means that there, there could be some urban variable that we're missing that is providing some sort of uh, protective effect on a neighborhood. So it may be it's a neighborhood that you know we think should be home to prostitution, but is not. And there are a lot of potentially interesting reasons why not that could inform uh, you know, policy uh, or public investment or urban planning factors, maybe some sort of social capital or something like that. And so to bring this back to the trafficking side, again, as I said, this is one of our initial exploratory analyses. We are combining models like this with uh, specific movement data that Dominique is uh, gleaning from trafficking victims that she's interviewing in an attempt to see how well pr prostitution arrests are a proxy variable for trafficking. And we're expanding this to, to other cities, including, uh, as she said, uh, Las Vegas and, and LA and Phoenix. Um, so that's it for the spatial crime side. I'll pass this over to Jorge. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so uh, what uh, Eddie showed you was kind of a micro level analysis of the problem of human trafficking with a proxy of prostitution. So in this part of the, um, of the study, we want to do a more macro level analysis in which we understand or we, we, uh, we study the movement of victims and the decisions factors for traffickers to move a victim and then some type of behaviors that we study from the interviews about their behavior during a trip. So in that sense, what we want to do is if we understand what is the structure of the network behind the human trafficking uh, problem, then we can design better interventions to disrupt that network. So in this case, we're focusing on movement, we're focusing on, those, on that logic of the trafficker of what to do next, where to move, where to go. Um, and then with that, we are um, happily using this interdisciplinary approach where we try to combine elements from social sciences, public policy, engineering, computer science, and geography, which is uh, the background of each of us in the study. And then we are um, going a step back because in, sometimes in, in some aspects, the uh, engineers or mathematicians or, or people in, in, in quantitative methods, uh, they assume that the data is available. But in this case, data is very hard to find. It's very um, uh, difficult to gather. So we went a step back and we worked on the design of the collection instruments, in this case, the interviews and the uh, surveys, 
uh, to collect the data that we want. And specifically, we wanted uh, we uh, were uh, modifying those uh, instruments to ask the victims and the detectives uh, location-specific questions. So in some cases, we're uh, using maps for the victims and the detectives to actually point out where they were, where they went, um, which would help us discover those routes or those movement patterns. We're also asking time-specific questions because that gives us a sense of how is their decision in terms of how far they travel, how, how many hours they travel during the day, how far they go, um, to other states, is that influenced by some type of events in the locations that they are moving across? Uh, and with that, we are uh, kind of trying to understand the decision specific factors of the of the traffickers. Um, the whole idea there is that if we understand that we can create networks, so we can create a system in the computer that mimics the logic of human traffickers and then help us discover some elements for the disruption of those of those networks. And then in the, in the right, you see the kind of the big picture scheme that we're using. We are combining many elements in this case. Uh, the most important for us is the interviews and surveys that we're doing with Dominic, uh, where we modify those instruments to gather actually quantitative data, and we're blending that into uh, some kind of abstract structures to understand the problem. And that is the next slide. Uh, where we have kind of a high level description of what a network for human trafficking will look like. Uh, we have the human contact layer where we have interconnections between individuals. It, they could be law and law enforcement, it could be social services, it could be victims, traffickers. We have a transportation layer that is actual uh, network infrastructure network where uh, we understand how they move. And we have a financial layer, which is where um, uh, traffickers and victims and, and clients uh, do the transactions. Um, so understanding that would help us identify locations uh, to allocate the scarce resources and then disrupt in the best way possible that uh, trafficking network. So from this part of the study, we have focused on the transportation network only. Um, that's the one we have access. And so now we have created some of those based on the interview service and then other analysis. And that's what I will show you in the next slide. In that transportation network, what we can do is we can do some some analysis to determine where to locate interventions to maximize the coverage. So here we are relying on the eyes of the public. We want to because uh, our traffickers we we discovered that traffickers move and move sometimes long distance using the road network. Then we want to locate interventions so we maximize the public eye on the problem. And then interventions in this case, they are not necessarily human, um, they're not necessarily law, law enforcement actions. They might be just uh, training or dissemination of information, training of hotels employees, training of restaurant employees, so they can detect or they can be trained to understand, to identify a uh, potential human trafficking case. And then if we locate those interventions at the strategic places, then we maximize the coverage of that, those possible movements of human traffickers and, and victims. So with that, we are using primarily the information from the interviews and surveys from detectives and, and victims, but we're also enlarging that network based on the logic that we identify. So we have some primary paths or primary trips that uh, traffickers made, but then with the questions that we have around uh, that trip, we can understand how, ma how many hours they're traveling, if they're using uh, highways or small roads, uh, where are they staying, what kind of locations they prefer. So we enhance the network with other trips or other uh, paths that they could be consistent with that logic, but that they were not that discovered explicitly by the interviews and surveys. So in this case, this is a high level uh, model, a mathematical model that Arun is going to be in detail, uh, soon explaining more detail. But the idea here is that we want to disrupt those movements. And then because we don't have primary or perfect information on how they move, what we want is to disrupt as much as possible, as many routes as possible, including the ones that were really discovered by the instruments and also others that we didn't see that nobody talked about, but they could be potential routes that, that traffickers are, are using. And then also uh, subject, subject to a budget constraint or to a resource constraint, because we know that resources are not infinite, so we need to actually uh, find the best locations to allocate the resources in the most uh, efficient way. So uh, Arun will give you a much deeper uh, detail on how we're doing this and how we how is the technical construction of those networks and the implications. Um, so go ahead, Arun. 
Oh, thank you, Jorge. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Okay, so now this is basically a very interdisciplinary type of work as uh, Dominic already mentioned that there are, uh, there are social scientists like Dominic as well as uh, people who work on the quantitative side of things like myself, Jorge and Tony and Eddie. So Jorge started on talking about the interdiction part of this uh, research project see that this type of work probably would not have been possible if we are not working with someone like Dominic because the data, the model that we built is essentially based on the data that Dominic managed to get from her collaboration with the Las Vegas Police Department. So this uh, data probably wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So based on the law enforcement file, uh, trafficker victim uh, movement, we basically got a data uh, sample of which you can see on the screen. That is, it basically lists the uh, incidences over, uh, I think, a uh, couple of years. And it basically identifies the victim, uh, trafficker, trafficker type, relation. That that's basically the relationship between the trafficker and the victim. Destination city, I put C1. In this case, C1 is basically Las Vegas. So everything is uh, terminating in Las Vegas. And uh, when they talk to the victim, they basically talk to where they started from, which is the originating city. Occasionally, they would also mention that uh, from the originating city, they have visited some intermediate cities. In the abstract model, we call it C2, C3, C4, C5. In the police data, they have actually names of all these cities, all these cities. So this is the uh, data that we received from Las Vegas Police Department. Based on that, when we are looking at that, basically, if we are trying to do interdiction, essentially, if some uh, some traffic originating at city C5 and then city C1, it's not, it's a very, it could be C5 could be New York City and C1 could be Las Vegas. So in order to interdict, it probably will not be very helpful where to interdict. New York is very far from Las Vegas. Okay, very far from Las Vegas. So now there is a path which is basically originating at New York City, terminating at Las Vegas. What is, and this is what we call a very high level description. And we call this path to be a logical path. For interdiction purpose, what is important to know, what is the physical path that was taken? Okay, so unless we know the physical path, we interdiction probably will not make a whole lot of sense. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what you see on the screen is basically there are all these flows or paths which are uh, originating at various different cities in the United States and essentially terminating in Las Vegas. That's uh, red lines that you see on the uh, left uh, figure here. Okay, left figure here. So I was mentioning that something, uh, some traffic may originate in New York City ending at Las Vegas. And sometimes there could be intermediate cities that somebody might say that from New York City, we went to Atlanta, and then from Atlanta, we went to uh, Las Vegas. But then <coughs> that is very high level description. So I'm just uh, having on the right hand side of the screen, you can see one logical path which originated in uh, New York City ending at Las Vegas. Now, this is what I was calling the logical path we need to know which one was the physical path that was taken. So as you can see that the black dotted lines are basically could have been the physical paths and corresponding to this logical path, they may have taken any one of these physical paths. So if law enforcement is basically trying to interdict, they need to know the logical path information is very high level to be very useful. So in order to have low level uh, information, like what is the physical path that was taken, that will be important for the law enforcement interdiction uh, case. So next slide, please. Next slide, okay. So likely, so what we try to do is basically try to estimate which one is our likely physical path. So a couple of things that go into that consideration that trafficker will not use a path whose travel expense exceeds the budget. We assume that the trafficker has some budget cannot take a very long route, uh, which is going to be very expensive. And trafficker also has some estimate of the risk associated with the road segments connecting to uh, cities. And trafficker will likely use the physical path whose interdiction risk is minimum and is within the budget. 
So that's the assumption that you make that this is a, basically from the Kafka's point of view, Kafka is going to take the path, which is this risky path, as long as it doesn't exceed the budget. Now, this is from the Kafka's perspective. From the law enforcement perspective, what is their objective? The law enforcement agencies, they interdict a road segment. The, the assumption is that all illicit traffic using a physical path that uses a road segment, that can be disrupted. That can be disrupted could be, uh, uh, could be a segment between New Orleans and Houston, for example. Okay, so if that segment is intersected, uh, inter interdicted, then all the traffic flowing through that segment can be stopped or in, uh, disrupted. So payoff from interdiction of a road segment is the volume of illicit traffic that can be disrupted. Interdiction of a road segment involves, again, inter from the law enforcement perspective also, there is a cost and budget involved. Interdiction on a road segment involves a certain amount of cost, and they also have an operational budget. The objective of the law enforcement agencies is to maximize payoff subject to the budget constraint. So inside the trafficker may take a path that is not necessarily the shortest one from the originating to the destinating city if it reduces the risk of interdiction and satisfies the travel budget. What you see on the right-hand side, the screen, we basically from the US interstate highway map, we basically build this graph, what we call US interstate network graph, which is very realistic. It basically gives the distances, various uh, cities, and so on, important cities in each of the states. And we basically carry out our analysis on this graph, which is very realistic graph, which is uh, captured from US interstate. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I guess uh, that's pretty much what we are doing. And uh, obviously, this is a summary of the work that we are doing. If anyone is interested in learning more in detail, we'll be happy to talk to them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fascinating uh, presentation.